All right. Get everybody's uh, attention here today. So uh, we are spending our final day here in the Triassic. I hope the last like several lectures and the lab last week about marine reversions has really like underscored how wild the Triassic is. I hope you guys have really taken in how many different kinds of vertebrate body plans evolved, how many amazing morphologies show up in the Triassic. And I kind of love organizing a paleontology class. In a minute, we'll talk about it. Dinosaurs are like the vanguard of paleontology. Most people in the world know about dinosaurs. That's what they think about and think about paleontology. I love the Triassic. And so I really enjoy taking people like you, taking students to the Triassic and be like, we're gonna do the dinosaurs dead last so that nobody else has to be like in their shadow. And I hope with like, oh my God, there's been so many things and now here's just another group of animals that evolved in the Triassic sometime after that mass extinction. It's an ongoing area of research, just how closely the true monophyletic clay dinosauria is to the mass extinction boundary. It's a little farther away from it than we initially thought, maybe like 10 years ago, which is really interesting. Um, but let's get into these dinosaurs and their origins. And so I hope of all the animals I've shown you so far, these probably require the least of you to like wrinkle your brow and be like, what am I looking at? Probably because if you go to Fred Meyer right now, I bet there's 30 you could buy. That's not true for a lot of the other clades of animals that we've seen so far. So do me a favor. This is a lovely uh, self-portrait of the dinosaur family tree. It's just a monophyletic clade of animals called Dinosauria. You'll notice how sparrows and crows included in that picture because they absolutely are dinosaurs. So enjoy yourselves, talk to your neighbor, see any familiar faces. Yep, with their pneumatized vertebrae. Yep. We really don't appreciate uh, sheer multiple disparity. It's a funny endeavor. All right, who are we seeing? Who are we recognizing? Any fan favorites up here? Sauropods. Sauropods, those are the ones with big long neck dinosaurs. I don't know if you guys are like beyond me saying little foot and having that mean anything to you or not. <laughs> but yes, the long neck dinosaurs. <laughs> what else? Stegosaurus. Oh boy, come on now. The classics, the OGs, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's really interesting. These are all animals that are found in like the late 1800s or early 1900s in the American West. And then like America gets really famous with all its big dinosaurs. And it's really amazing to me that like new dinosaurs are being found all the time. There's new dinosaurs already from 2024. But because of like historical context, these ones have been known for a long time. And then humans like invented TV and invented movies and started making things. And so there's no way anybody's ever catching up, I don't think, with T-Rex, even if we find many other large predatory dinosaurs like this. And there's some historical contingency there that's pretty fun. What else? Anything else? Uh, is it a purple one? I don't know. It's full, like... 
dinosaur name, but isn't it's it like reference as like a dilo? This one right here, the purpley one? Yes. That's the Lophosaurus. Uh, that's the one in Jurassic Park that has the frill and spits the acid. Both of those things are completely without any evidence, <laughs> but they are very fun. And you got to give people like Michael Crichton credit because that's a really important thing to remember. All we ever have of these animals, for the most part, not only, but for the most part, is their bones. And so you can look at the bones as a whole movement in paleo art that looks at the bones of animals today and said, if you never saw the living thing, would you ever reconstruct it looking like this or looking like that? And of course, the answer is very clearly no. You know, a perfect example of that that I always like is like, look at a goat skeleton. Okay. And then a bunch of photos of goats like up in the top of trees because goats can run up trees. And it doesn't look like they can, but they do all the time. And so how would you know if this one can or not? That's really fun. Uh, and so, yes, there's no evidence that this thing has a giant frill and spits acid at all. <laughs> That's a very uh, surprising thing. But it's, I commend it. I think it's a good choice because the public is like, oh, wow, that's something. All right. But there's a lot we do know. One of the things that is very clear in dinosaur science is the balance between speculation versus like very informed inference versus like, oh, we have that evidence. One of the first lectures we had Lecture three, technically, the first one we guys all had in the same room together, we talked about those levels of knowledge you can get from fossils. I know this thing swims with 100% certainty versus, oh, it has live birth versus what color was it? Dinosaurs are almost always the test case for how far we can push our knowledge, which is really cool. So there's a bunch of famous things up here, lots of very small guys. Um, dinosaurs, of course, are famous for being really big. So I kind of like, have to give them their due. Uh, I really stand by this sentence. This is a clade of animals like any other, but I actually think that like geology departments wouldn't function economically without dinosaurs because almost every geology department in the world has a dinosaurs non-majors class and that's where they get their tuition dollars because people like dinosaurs. The fossil record, evolution, science in general. If you guys watch a science TV show, there's gonna be a spinning microscope and a DNA spiral and an eagle scream and a T-Rex. There's always a dinosaur. So these animals are really special because they're in our minds. Humans have decided that they are these important symbols of so many other ideas. But what I think is important for you guys to really remember is that even though there's incredibly charismatic animals that actually in a scientifically intriguing way are important because like it's possible this animal is representing the biggest possible body size on land given this planet's gravity. That's very... That's pretty awesome and interesting, something to talk about. But it's also important to me that as we talk about these animals, you guys remember that that word, which is a very big popular word, dinosauria, is a node on the tree, just like vertebrata, just like navistomata, just like enura, which is frogs. It's just a node on the tree of life. And so there are charismatic things in here, and there are really fun ways we can get into their science and how we know what we know. But these are all another group of just animals. I like that these ones mostly have their mouths shut. I don't like it when every T-Rex I ever see has like a <laughs> extended lower jaw with all its teeth out, right? These are just animals. Um, and then another thing that just goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it, is that this is an, a clade that is famous for being extinct, but it is of course technically, and in every real sense of the word, not extinct at all, because birds are alive today, birds are dinosaurs, and birds are the most speciose tetrapods we even have. So if you want to do raw species, there's still more dinosaurs than mammals now, just like there probably was in terms of what we have in the fossil record anyway, uh, back in all these other times. So there's our little dinosauria intro. Here we are back in the Triassic. All these animals you guys have met in the last week or two. This one was just, you met these on Tuesday. The crown group archosaurs. So here's all the animals that are more closely related to today's crocodiles. And all these animals over here, including things like pterosaurs, are most closely related to today's birds, which go right here in this clade, Theropoda. Dinosauria is a monophyletic clade. It's got two big branches, ornithischians on one side, and then these two go together here. You're going to learn that clade in a second on the other side. You guys can see the temporal duration of dinosauria. We have our earliest dinosaur fossils, true members of these clades, are from a really constrained period of time, 234-ish million years ago, almost certainly in Southern Pangaea, what's today, South America and Africa, that's where dinosaurs show up, that's where they start. It has this amount of time away, 16 million years or so probably, 17 million years or so probably from that end Permian mass extinction. So definitely removed from the immediate 
aftermath of the extinction, but you can see that dinosaurs fit into this much bigger radiation of archosaur and archosaur morph reptiles. It's really cool. They're part of that bloom. I have one character for Dinosauria. I gave it to you on Tuesday, so you don't necessarily need to whip your pens out real quick. And that's bipedality. It's very, very, very cool and interesting to me that one of the most successful and diverse clades of vertebrate animals terrestrially is dinosaurs and their ancestral condition, the plesiomorphic body feeling for dinosaurs is being bipedal. That's super unusual. And so I talked about this on Tuesday too, so I won't belabor it, but early members of the long neck dinosaur lineage, that's the sauropods, early members of the ornithischian lineage, that's all these things like triceratops and stegosaurus, early members of theropoda, are all bipedal. Birds today are in this group. Birds just inherited that bipedality. That's pretty awesome. Here's an overview of biodiversity. Ornithischians on one side, the other two, long-necked dinosaurs and median dinosaurs on the other. You saw this also on Tuesday, so I'll get through it for now. Let's talk about the actual biodiversity here. So on the left-hand side of Dinosauria, there's this clade called Sorischia, which literally means lizard hips. You guys know Ischium is one of the bones in the pelvis. So the lizard hip dinosaurs, monophyletic clade that's the theropods, the meat eaters, and the sauropodomorphs, the long necks for the most part over here. Here are some of the earliest dinosaurs. Every single one of those 230-ish million year old dinosaurs that we actually have a fossil of is a Sariscian or pretty close to a Sariscian. <laughs> and this is what they look like. I'm showing you both the sauropod lineage on this slide and the theropod lineage on this slide. So these are the earliest members of the gigantic long neck dinosaur lineage. This is literally the fossil record we have. This is what they look like. Do me a favor, talk to your neighbors, make some observations, and make some inferences about the lifestyles of these early long neck dinosaurs. they come from that to his teeth. Because they're too big, and then they go from bipedal to particularly back to all right, what's something? What's what are you guys? What's jumping out? First of all, this is Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Oh, well, I did. But, <laughs> well, I what, what are you going to say? Oh, um. Well, is it rather just, I guess, in my question? Yeah. Um, is at this time, uh, do these sauropods, do they have, do they have, do they have new, new, new the pneumatic bones? Uh, bones, yes. Uh, so that is something that is, uh, we're seeing a lot of sculpturing and things like the vertebrae and things like that. I'm not remembering, I don't think they have anything like the pneumaticity um, we would talk about that birds have. But well, we're going to talk about the vertebrae of these animals later. These early ones, not quite. Not, not, not quite really, yet. no. Um, What's something very obvious about these things that's jumping out to you guys? They have long necks. They got some long necks, little longer necks. Yeah, maybe. So something's going on. That's interesting. I can't tell you how much I love that some of the ones that we have faces for have just a mouthful of totally sharp teeth that if you like analyze those teeth in any way you want, they're just meteor teeth. They have serrations, they're recurved, they're thin, labiolingually. These are early dinosaurs. Almost all the early dinosaur fossils we have are little bipedal carnivores. And so these animals have features in their 
limbs and in their skull that betray them as like the early relatives of giant long neck dinosaurs that only eat plants later, the biggest herbivores of all time. But I think it's just really spectacular that you can go to the fossil record and see that even the earliest forms are little carnivores. And we see that transition. So some of these animals are almost certainly omnivorous, like Manphagia and Saturnalia. But this is the uh, maxilla and premaxilla, maxilla and premaxilla, that's the little snout of that guy, Burialestes, right there, absolutely has these recurved serrated teeth. So the fact that like earlier little sauropods are little carnivores is fantastic because you guys have seen so often, especially back here in the Paleozoic, early Mesozoic, the default condition for big radiations of terrestrial vertebrates is like small bodied meat eaters become whatever they want later. And that's true for sauropods. I think that's really great that we have these fossils to look at. Here's what happens very quickly though in sauropod evolution. Everything I just showed you on the last slide are some of these earliest sauropodomorphs. That last slide is like here. This slide is now more up in here, the late Triassic, the long part of the late Triassic. And so you can see a lot of things happening. Increases in body size, uh, some of them moving towards facultative quadrupedality. That means that sometimes they get down on all fours and walk around on all fours, but they can still stand up if they want to. Uh, and then eventually in the Triassic, there are some very large, these are all to scale with a person right here, very large sauropodomorphs that become fully quadrupedal. I hope you can see the, like, the long necks are getting there. They're long pretty much the whole time. There's lots of ecological diversity here in terms of like body size and reach. Um, really fun animals. I, you've already seen this picture, which I really love because this is one of these early sauropods, this one right here. And here's one of these awful crocodile monsters that is living in the same habitat as it. And so a terrestrial Ravasukian, Sudasukian animal preying upon an early long neck dinosaur that's quadrupedal and huge, pretty spectacular, pretty interesting to imagine. Um, and so in the Triassic, Sauropodomorphs are among the most well-known animals. We have many, many, many genera and species of long-necked, these dinosaurs called sauropodomorphs throughout the Triassic. They have a really excellent record. We can talk about their biogeography. They're found on almost all continents. There's even some from Antarctica. It's pretty great. Sauropodomorphs are well-known. The other lineage of Sauriscians are the meat-eating dinosaurs, the theropod dinosaurs. And so here's what they look like in the Triassic. I'll let you take a minute to talk to your neighbor's quick about these. yeah <laughs> I don't sometimes like so So I think these guys kind of just look like little uh dinosaurs. Like if you guys were to like just close your eyes and like what's a dinosaur kind of look like, it's all something like this, right? These like bipeds, carnivorous. I think you'll agree they also have relatively long necks. That's kind of a dinosaur thing, not just a long necked dinosaur thing, not just a sauropodomorphic thing. Something that is true in these bipedal animals, and believe it or not, is actually true for these sauropods too, is bipedal animals tend to have a lot of functionality in their forelimbs if they're not using them to walk around. So a lot of these sauropods have pretty advanced like hands and claws and ways of flexing their hands. They're definitely using them for all kinds of things, probably for foraging, probably for interacting. But their hands are like highly functional. This one's like got these huge claws that's using to grip up onto this tree. And the same is true in the theropods. So these meat-eating dinosaurs, animals like Herrerasaurus, uh, animals like Coelophysis, you can see they've got pretty long arms. These long arms we say are raptorial. They've got really big claws on the end of them. And so something we're seeing that's very different from other archosaurs, a lot of those Sudasukian archosaurs you saw that are also carnivores that also live at the same time, those animals have great big heads with great big mouths full of great big teeth and they're chomping, chomping, chomping almost certainly to get their food. Dinosaurs, especially these meat-eating dinosaurs, 
they're kind of middling size on the landscape. Certainly none of them are like the biggest animal around. They've got a mouthful of sharp teeth, but they have these really long arms with big claws on them. So there's probably a very different way of gathering their food. And as a human, I hope you can appreciate these bipedal animals using their arms, using their hands, having a lot of evolution happening up there. It's very cool. A couple of things you guys can tell, these are Archosaur characters, right? So here's our orbit, here's our giant antorbital fenestra on this skull. That's this animal, here's Zupeosaurus. Here's Coelophysis, here's Herrerasaurus. Same idea, right? Orbit, lower temporal fenestra, antorbital fenestra, naris. One, two, three, four, those same things, those archosauriform fenestra there in front of the eye. A lot of ornamentation starts to show up in these guys. There's a while in the late Triassic and into the Jurassic when a lot of these dinosaurs in a couple of different clays have like crests and what have to be display structures on their face, very delicate structures. The one with the frill that spits acid from the movie Jurassic Park, of course, has these frills too. Really interesting and fun to think about. We don't really know what they look like. <clears throat> All right, so that's your Sorisciens. Um, the other side of dinosaur evolution in the Triassic are these ornithischians. And so these are the bird-hipped dinosaurs. Now, the more like people who are like squinting a little bit will be like, didn't you just tell us that birds are theropods and that all these dinosaurs are called lizard-hipped dinosaurs? And now you're telling me that this other clade over here are the bird-hipped dinosaurs. Yes, indeed I am. That is a mistake from the 1880s that we will all live with forever. And it's not a mistake, it's a great observation. It's just not totally exactly accurate for what birds really are. So when dinosaurs were first being described and studied in the 1800s, in the 1880s, somebody made the distinction of, oh, look, there's a group over here that have hips like a lizard, meaning an ilium up top, a pubis up front, and an ischium down the back. That's what almost all reptiles have. That's pretty much what mammals have, although ours look different than this now this like, kind of like radiant condition, one, two, three for the hips. So that's the saurischian condition, the lizard hip condition. This is inherited by all these animals and all the other archosaurs have that same kind of thing. Ornithischians do a thing where they've got their pubis pointing backwards and parallel with their ischium, and then another process of their pubis sticking out straight forward, not down in front of them. Does that make sense? So birds today have a pubis that's just like this. And you guys are going to see throughout there about evolution, this pelvis basically evolved into this one. So birds have a pelvis that looks like this, but ornithischians did it first. It's very helpful for identifying. If you guys are in a museum, look at Triceratops, look at Stegosaurus, and then run over to T-Rex. You will see the way the pelvis is oriented. You can do it at the IMNH when we go. You'll be able to see an ornithischian mounted and a Sariskian mounted. You'll be able to see these dinosaur hips. But so the bird hip dinosaurs are all animals like this does not include birds. <laughs> the lizard hip dinosaurs are all animals like this, and birds uh, are part of that group. Sorry. So that's the derived condition, the bird hip pelvis that ornithischians have. We are going to talk about that uh, later for what that deal is. And that condition of a lizard hip isn't like two sides of the same coin. We're like, one evolved bird hips, one evolved lizard hips. No, lizard hips is just what all reptiles pretty much have. And then the ornithischians have this derived condition in their hips. We're going to talk about it when we talk about ornithischian biodiversity, but it's really important to me that you have it now in our dinosaur slides. The other synapomorphy that all ornithischians share, which I think is extremely cool, is they have an extra bone in their skull that no other dinosaurs have. They have a dentary full of teeth that makes up the tooth-bearing part of their lower jaw, but then they have on the midline, right here on what you think of as their chin or their lower beak, you could call it, they have an extra bone. It's called the pre-dentary. And so here's the skull of a great big duckbill dinosaur from really late in dinosaur time. And here's a skull of a really early ornithischian from the earliest Jurassic. And they both have this little tiny bone sitting at the very front of their jaws. That bone was covered in like a keratinous sheath. So it had a beak on it, only on the bottom. This animal's got beak up top, beak on bottom. This animal's got teeth up top, beak on bottom. But that predentary bone that has a keratin sheath is absolutely a character, a synapomorph before ornithischians. So the bird-like hips, bird-hipped, and the predentary are characters that unite the ornithischian dinosaurs. And so here's something that's extremely problematic for anybody who studies the Triassic. It's constantly a topic of conversation. Literally last year at the conference, two of the talks that got generated the most buzz were people trying to solve this problem because it's a real problem. I will let you read this. I just showed you that Dinosauria has a great fossil record in terms of theropods and sauropodomorphs, 
that go all the way back to the early part of the late Triassic, 230 some million years ago. You don't really get Ornithischians until the next hole on period, the Jurassic. That means you're missing like 30 million years of Ornithischians that should be there. Now there are a ton of those other archosaurs you guys have met that some people think actually might be those early Ornithischians and we're not recognizing them yet. That's really exciting. For a long time, the Ornithischian fossil record all around the world from the Triassic was isolated teeth. These teeth have all these little cusps on them, these little crenulations. They look kind of like leafy teeth. Those are teeth for eating plants. Certainly Ornithischian dinosaurs that live in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods have teeth like this. And so for a while, everything was fine because, okay, maybe we don't have a good skeleton, but we've got plenty of teeth of Ornithischians. So they're around. Well, something that happened in the last 10 or 15 years is that it turns out that the only one that we have that might have a body fossil might actually be another kind of archosaur. And all those loose teeth over there belong to herbivorous crocodiles. So it's cool that crocodile relatives, pseudosuchians, this little aetosaur relative, evolved herbivory, but it's a real problem because now when you find loose teeth like this, probably they're crocodile teeth and not dinosaur teeth. So we are, just like we can't tell you 100% confident where turtles go, living in a world where we have all these dinosaurs, and obviously dinosaurs like Stegosaurus and Duckbills and Triceratops are very famous, but when it comes to tying their node perfectly into one spot on the dinosaur tree, we're missing a lot of the Triassic. We're missing almost the entire Triassic. I just like to give that up front because I think it's kind of revolting, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. And that's a challenge and it is uh, initiates even better science, right? So something's wrong. Our model's missing something and we'll find it. Uh, there's a lot of very crazy ideas and I'm happy to talk about them any other time you want to talk about them. But okay, look at that. Don't you hate it? It's a black line instead of a gray bar. No. All right. Let's talk about the end of the Triassic though real quick. So you guys have walked through a number of these mass extinctions. Um, in our mass extinction lab, we talked about the different ways we can measure mass extinction. You guys did an excellent job on your take home telling me about background extinction versus mass extinction and ways they can compare. So extinctions like the Ordovician that have a huge amount of species loss, but not necessarily a lot of ecological devastation mean that there's not a lot of change in terms of how oceans function, even though it's a really massive extinction. Whereas the PT has even more species loss and they're almost like a reset of different ecosystems in the water and on the land. Now that we're in the Triassic, you can see there's really only two mass extinctions left. And one of them is at the end of the Triassic, the end of Triassic mass extinction. Do me a favor real quick, because we haven't done this in a minute. Look at this map of the Triassic. Uh, I'm not asking you to think about the extinction. This is just for fun. Take like 30 seconds, talk to your neighbors about this map of the Triassic. What's it look like? What do you notice? Where's Idaho? Yeah, it's yeah, you need me to cover that up next time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right, I'm hearing people talk about deserts. That's great. So this is still the time of Pangea. Pangea is a little different than it was. It's moved north since you guys last saw it on our Permian slides and on the early Triassic slides I showed you. Pangea has moved north. It used to be a little more down on the southern pole. Now it's more up on the northern pole. It's getting a little thin right here. Some of you I heard noticing these bodies of water. These are lakes. These lakes are the little baby Atlantic Ocean opening up between North America and Africa. The North Atlantic opens first and then the South Atlantic opens second. So basically since this time, every single day of all of these 200 million years, the Atlantic Ocean has gotten a little bit bigger and the Pacific Ocean has gotten a little bit smaller and that's just still happening. So that's a very fun thing to think about. Idaho's right here. All the rocks we have from Idaho, as you might remember from our marine reversions lab, all of our Triassic rocks are ocean rocks. So we've got ichthyosaurs and ammonites and things like that from Idaho. Here we are on the coast. Nice and fun. But so what happens at the end of the Triassic? This is this mass extinction. And so you guys have already seen this a little bit. Um, the end Triassic has a lot of the same extinction signs that the end Permian does. 
There is a very clear and well-dated igneous province associated with the boundary. Its impacts on vertebrates are really sticky and hard, and that's probably mostly due to like the rock record around this boundary that contained vertebrate fossils, but there still is a giant amount of lava from this time. There's a similar signal, though not as extreme, of global average climate change going up by six degrees Celsius. Good evidence, probable evidence for ocean acidification, other things like toxic metal poisoning that are consistent with the volcanism. And so when we go to like a graph like this, you guys can see Pangaea is kind of at its height, uh, does break, starts to break up in the, uh, sorry, the next period, the Jurassic. You can see that Triassic, Jurassic extinction is one of the largest. This is and always has been one of those big five, even from the 80s, the Triassic extinction has been identified. And so there's no asteroid impact associated with it. There is a volcanic province associated with it. And so this is that volcanic province, which is so cool to me. It's called the Camp, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. It's massive volcanism associated with the rifting apart of Pangaea and the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. The lava deposits that you can correlate are in modern day like Brazil and modern day West Africa and modern day New York City and modern day Europe. So I've always thought it was totally incredible that these cliffs called the Palisades that are across from Manhattan are literally the lava flows from this mass extinction. If you watch old Batman, Wayne Manor is on these cliffs. The bat plane comes out of those cliffs, which is really fun. So this is another mass extinction. It's not as well constrained in a lot of its details as the end Permian is, but you guys should expect it's basically a similar kind of thing in miniature. So you're having massive volcanism affecting the chemistry of the oceans, massive volcanism affecting the chemistry of the atmosphere, warming, acidification, all those similar signs. And so how does that affect vertebrates? What happens in vertebrate evolution? This is also a really fun way to talk about evidence for continents moving, isn't it? That these lava flows like can all be dated and then you just go like this. You're like, oh, okay, it's one big eruption. It's really cool. There are some sequences of uh, sedimentary rocks that are in North Carolina and there's like photos of them. And then you can see the same sedimentary rocks in Morocco facing the other way. And nothing makes me happier than Morocco and North Carolina like looking at each other and drifting apart. Anyway, I want to talk about what happens to all these vertebrates across the Jurassic, a uh, Triassic Jurassic mass extinction boundary or the end Triassic mass extinction. So, similar to what you guys saw when we were talking about fishes and other clades through the Triassic, here's how that boundary kind of affects a biodiversity. So, we have Sicilian fossils from the late Triassic, we have frog fossils all the way from the beginning of the Triassic. But you guys already saw this, so it's worth just revisiting real quickly. We have the inferred presence of salamanders in the Triassic. We don't have any good fossils of them that are diagnosably for sure salamanders. We do have very solid salamanders as soon as the Jurassic starts. And obviously there's salamanders outside right now in this count. So salamanders, frogs, and Sicilians interact with that extinction boundary like this. Here's our mammals, our therapsids, our synapsids. So we lose our dicytodonts at the end of the Triassic. So sorry, that was the last time you'll see them from me probably. We lose a lot of these non-mammalian cynodonts. And some of these little mammaliaformes, things like that Morganucodon animal that grows slowly, but it's nice and tiny and has a denary squamosal jaw joint like a mammal, those do survive. And of course, mammals are still around today. We're gonna to talk about plenty of mammal evolution that happened in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Here's a bunch of just other reptiles. The last of those para-reptiles, those little burrowing guys, they go extinct. Some of these marine reptile clades go extinct. Ichthyosaurs do not. Ichthyosaurs, those dolphin lizards, they do, the fish lizards, they do survive well into the Jurassic and Cretaceous, as do this lineage of uh, marine reptiles, the plesiosaurs. They're one of the only ones that make it through of all the diverse marine reptiles that were in the Triassic. The first uh, solid, solid, solid fossils of squamates, so the modern group of lizards and also snakes, they show up in the earliest part of the Jurassic. And you guys have seen that the Rhynchocephalians, that's the animal that's the Tuatara today, they have a really good Triassic fossil record and they make it through that boundary. If I throw on a bunch of these archosaur reptiles now, obviously amazing animals, many, many, many go extinct at or near that boundary. Archosaur morphs, archosaur forms, crown group archosaurs that are close to crocs, some crown group archosaurs that are close to dinosaurs, turtles make it through the Triassic and are still going strong. And then here's a bunch of these crown group archosaurs. 
crocodiles, pterosaurs, and three clades of dinosaurs that make it through. Frustratingly, infuriatingly, the Ornithischian fossil record starts here, and I don't have a bar right there, but check back in 20 years, we'll have a good answer, I'm sure. I think how I want you guys to really think about this, actually do me a favor, like read that with your neighbors and then uh, see if it makes sense to you. I think I like this because so many of these animals that are really challenging and like, what is he showing us? Go away here. And what you're left with is animals that are definitely like not familiar to you in terms of like plesiosaurs and like giant dinosaurs. But when you get out of your time machine in this period or in this period and just start walking around, you're going to see like things that you're like, that's a bird. That's a little furry mammal. There's a lizard. And it just is a lizard instead of just some kind of early reptile. It's a pretty familiar vertebrate terrestrial biosphere with like the exceptions of <laughs> gigantic uh, dinosaur animals running around everywhere. But in many of the details, like that's not a thing that looks like a turtle. It is a turtle. That's not a thing that looks like a crocodile. It is a crocodile. And so that's different, I think, than so much of this class has been so far when I've had to put little asterisks or little qualifiers on like, this is a shark, but it's not really like a shark. <laughs> that is what I like about this. And I hope it's really dramatic to you how these events, which are abiotic events, really change the flow of diversity on this planet. Losing all these clades, keeping all these for whatever reason, and then these ones radiating into all the evolutionary niche space. This isn't showing you anything about like body size or ecology, it's just showing you where they're living in time. These abiotic events have these huge effects on evolution. Because if there's not this massive volcanism, if there's not an extinction here, I don't believe that all of these would just all of a sudden go away for another reason. So these abiotic events can really sculpt vertebrate evolution. The other thing that I think is really important for you guys to take in and think about, and we're going to talk about this more in a second, is that the Jurassic and the Cretaceous are, for the most part, like this uninterrupted great time in Earth history. There are no red lines in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. There's no mass extinction events within. There's turnovers. There's climate change. Stuff happens. But many of these clays go all the way through for a long amount of time, 140 million years almost, of like peace on earth style kind of massive perturbations. That's really interesting. And so most of these clades radiate down here in the Jurassic somehow, you're gonna see that for the next several weeks. And then basically all the rest of the time through the Cretaceous is them just like diversifying more and more and more and more and more. It's really cool. So I want to talk about what these time periods look like before we actually get into the diversity here. So here's a nice slide. We're going to have our, our Jurassic summary slide. So the Jurassic goes from 201 to 145 million years ago. This is when many of the dinosaurs that you guys think of really do show up. I characterize uh, the dominant story of the Jurassic as the breakup of Pangaea into a southern supercontinent, which gets called Gondwana. You guys probably maybe have heard that word before, Gondwana, that's the southern continents. And Laurasia, which is the northern continents, North America, Europe, and most of Asia. 
And so that breakup starts in the Jurassic and keeps going. The pattern of continental separation is extremely important and informs a lot of the biodiversity we end up seeing. So think about, just put your biology hats on for a second. What's it like for animal populations living on a supercontinent where you can walk from pole to pole versus a breaking up place where there's now isolation and you know lack of gene flow? That's a big deal. The climate is pretty warm and pretty stable through the Jurassic. Marine ecosystems are extremely successful, extremely abundant. There's a lot of shallow ocean habitat. You can see all that light blue up there on the map. There's a lot of fossils from all parts of the world of the Jurassic. Most of the earliest fossils found in Europe of things like ichthyosaurs in like the early 1800s and things like that are Jurassic fossils. And so there's plenty of awesome marine tetrapods, plesiosaurs like this one, ichthyosaurs all through the Jurassic. There's a couple of times that crocodiles go into the water in the Jurassic that we're gonna talk about. You guys know, we talked about it just a teeny bit a couple weeks ago, that all those teleos really start diversifying. This animal here that looks like a whale is a giant ray fin fish that alter also filter feeding like a modern day whale kind of does, but it's using its gill rakers. So maybe more like a basking shark. Ammonites swimming around. Normal sharks, like actual sharks that are neosalachians show up in the Jurassic. Up on land, things like I said are familiar, but they're not quite familiar. If you get out of your time machine in the Jurassic, there's really not any flowering plants. The dominant plants are still things like different lineages of conifers, <clears throat> evergreens and cypresses, things like that, ginkgos, cycad, you know, those plants. So it's not quite a flora that's very familiar to you, although most of these organisms are uh, represented today by living members in the plant world. And then we have our dinosaurs really dominating, whatever that word means, I don't ever really like it, being the big bodied animals in most of the terrestrial ecosystems. Of course, there's crocs, of course, there's pterosaurs that are also doing big and interesting things too. In the Jurassic is when we get the diversification of our clade, mammalia. In the Jurassic, we get the first birds showing up, so feathered dinosaurs, the crown groups of turtles, the first squamates, these are all Jurassic occurrences. And so, Getting familiar in a lot of ways, getting fun in a lot of ways. The Cretaceous is uh, like the heyday, I always think of it as, of the whole Mesozoic era. So Pangaea is at like its maximum state of being broken up, and the continents have it reconnected in some other way, like you guys know they are today, and there's no ice caps. So the oceans are quite high. And so many, many, many of the continents host epicontinental seas. There's water breaking up land masses on the actual continents themselves, the shallow seas that go all the way up. You could be driving in Kansas right now and get off and find fossils of gigantic fishes and gigantic green reptiles in Kansas. That's why, and that's because of these seaways. Um, do me a favor, talk to your neighbors real quick about this Cretaceous map. Make some observations about it, geography-wise, but then also I really have a conversation real quick about like what does it mean for populations of organisms generally if you're at this maximum stage of like literal fragmentation of the living space. Go ahead and do that, please. Yeah.
All right, what kind of things are people talking about? Sorry, what are you guys talking about? We were talking about some of the bottlender changes that happened during Cretaceous. Okay, so what, what do you mean? Still had happened even though there was this fragmentation. So, how would the animals have gotten from one continent to another? Correct. The spurtle. Yeah, I mean, it's not impossible, it's just right. like likelihood is decreased when you have oceans. That's cool. Yeah. Something that happens in the Cretaceous that's really fun is you can like pick up on totally endemic faunas on different parts of these continents. And sometimes you can take multiple clades of vertebrates and line up all their phylogenies. And you'll see that like for frogs, these weird crocs, this kind of dinosaur and this kind of dinosaur and this kind of palm tree, they all have a phylogeny that goes like this. And you're like, that's Indian Madagascar breakup. And then this is the Indian palm, and that's the Malagasy palm. And that's true for the dinosaurs and the crocs and the frogs and whatever. And you're like, I think we got something. <laughs> that's really fun because a geologist can just look at the rock and be like, this is when they broke up. And you could be like, thanks. And you check the animals and plants, and you're like, I agree. And they're like, well, it doesn't matter you agree, but it's nice that, that we're seeing all, multiple lines of evidence for things like continents moving around. India Madagascar is super fun. That's India here, that's Madagascar there. Um, it's a really interesting place. We'll talk about it a little bit later. <laughs> so, okay, problem difference dispersal. Anybody else talking about anything else fun they want to bring up? We thought yes, marsupials had to show up around this time because. Uh, and, and placentals, right? They're our sister. You know, like, we are dually South tied to each other. You can't have one without the other. So, yeah, so what, what do you mean? South America is like about to leave. So <laughs> We gotta get up there. It's a really fun, like, kind of like nightmare alien mentality to be like, South America's leaving, like, <laughs> on the scale of tens of millions of years. But I, I know what you mean, of course. South America is breaking away. Right here, there's a, there's a gap forming between South America and Antarctica. Still cute. You can walk from Papua New Guinea all the way down to Antarctica, still in this time in the middle of the Cretaceous. Yeah, interesting. So the biogeography of these continents, uh, when we get to mammal evolution, it like couldn't be more obviously stamped on the face of mammals, how these continents are arranged. It's really cool. So thank you for taking the time to engage with that a little bit. So in marine ecosystems, uh, increasingly, like all the invertebrate faunas are getting super familiar. So in the Triassic is when you had invertebrate communities that are dominated by like bivalves, so clams, snails. Lobsters and crayfish and crabs, those kind of crustaceans, that's starting in the Triassic. By the time we're getting into the Cretaceous, extremely familiar marine ecosystems, with the exception of things like ammonites are still very abundant and everywhere, which don't exist anymore. Um, I, this is what I think about the oceans of the Cretaceous. We talked about this in the marine reversions lab. Like, and there's so many gigantic mouths full of teeth in the oceans. Like, if you're like scared of sharks, there's every shark you can think of body size wise is pretty much in those Cretaceous oceans. Plus on top of that, a whole nother trophic level of these gigantic reptiles. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, tons of marine reversions in the Cretaceous, just like in the Jurassic. So there's birds and snakes and turtles that also go into the water in the Cretaceous, which is really cool. Terrestrial ecosystems, we'll talk about it after spring break, but there's this whole phenomenon that's called the Cretaceous terrestrial revolution. And it's like, I'm going to say the second to last of like the gigantic important stories for making our modern ecosystems. And what this is, is the establishment of angiosperm or flowering plant dominated floras. That happens in the Cretaceous period. Flowering plants were, of course, just another kind of plant that has seeds, and so they're related to things like cycads and conifers. And so it's very controversial because flowering plants as a lineage have to go back to the Triassic. We have really, really, really minimal record of them. So they had to be not ecologically very abundant almost anywhere. But then once we get into the middle part of the Cretaceous, boy, oh boy, does that change. And by the end of the Cretaceous, when the asteroid ends up hitting up there at the top of that green bar, most of the plants on land terrestrially are flowering plants. And that is very familiar. So before you get this, think about these ecosystems that don't have like fruit or pollination syndromes and the different animals that are pollinating flowers. Without flowers, you don't have a lot of interesting animal evolution happening. 
Also, tons of insect groups that are modern appear. We also we have all the orders of insects in the Cretaceous, but like a lot of these families that are recognizable show up. Um, all so many of the best dinosaurs and pterosaurs, these big famous animals are in the Cretaceous. And then a lot of other things that are happening in the Cretaceous involve the like modern appearance of some families, like there's frog families and salamander families. There's a platypus, you know, from the Cretaceous. So truly like the modern representatives showing up, which is really cool. Lots of birds, lots of mammals, lots of little stuff you guys recognize. So I wanna talk about transitioning from the Triassic to the Jurassic. Uh, and I want to do that using sauropods. So we're going to jump now into our dinosaur biodiversity. We're going to do sauropods first. So today and on Tuesday next week, we'll be talking about the long neck dinosaurs, their evolution, their biodiversity. And so these animals have a really excellent Triassic fossil record. These are a bunch of different sauropods that we have from the Triassic. And then, of course, going across the boundary into the Jurassic. Uh, and one thing that I think is really fun is studying mass extinctions is very popular. And so paleontologists all over the world, especially in places like South America, India, Zimbabwe, are looking at early Jurassic rocks right now so that we can understand this extinction boundary and this recovery and how quickly different kinds of dinosaurs responded to that mass extinction. So this is a figure from a paper. I'm going to show you three different figures on this slide. They're all from different papers describing new early Jurassic or late Triassic sauropodomorphs. And there's a really cool story evolving. And so this is a bunch of the animals that are known from South Africa. South Africa has a lot of uh, long necked dinosaurs, so are and their relatives. As you can see, body size and also posture in the Triassic. And then here's that big red line of the mass extinction boundary. And then pretty quickly in the earliest Jurassic, most of the sauropods become, well, sauropodomorphs, I should say, become these animals that we call sauropods. They're down on all fours, and you can see they're getting quite big. And this is happening really close to the boundary, a pretty seemingly rapid response to the extinction. It's still on the scale of like a million years, but sauropods going from like, yeah, there's some big ones, but a lot of the diversity of these littler guys that are bipedal, there's a couple bipedal ones that make it across the boundary, but they don't last very long. This becomes kind of that default condition of being a sauropod. And there's a lot of parts to that. It's not just getting bigger and it's not just going on all fours. It's actually getting adapted to that big body plan. So this is this other new one that just got named a few years ago called Bagualia. And Bagualia is showing us all these adaptations in the architecture of the neck. As that neck doesn't just go from like, oh yeah, it's kind of long. Wow, what a delicate long neck to like, no, this is getting to be like many feet long, meters in length instead of feet in length, because the body size is going up. This animal has a like, quote unquote, long neck. Here's one of the ones you guys saw first, right? It has a long neck for its body size, but like, it's still only this long. When you start getting animals like in the early part of the Jurassic when sauropods get huge, you start getting necks that are like meters long, 10 meters long, more than 10 meters of neck. It's really remarkable. And that seems to happen, body size, quadrupedality, and that neck elongation really quickly once we get into the early part of the Jurassic and changes to how their limbs are structured, which actually is what we're gonna talk about on Tuesday next week. So these animals are definitely responding to that. Here's the biodiversity that we're going to go through when we talk about sauropodomorph evolution. Sauropods, you can see sauropods is a monophyletic group. All these animals, these five gray boxes here are sauropods. These animals are sauropodomorphs, so I have to be careful what I'm talking about them. But when I say sauropods, I'm talking about these guys. I like sauropods because they kind of remind me of dicynodonts in the sense that most people are like, how do you tell these things apart? They all have like thin and then really big and then thin again, <laughs> long tail, long neck. There are like, I don't even know what the number is, 140, I think, species of sauropods that we know. So there's plenty of ways we do tell them apart and they do have pretty amazing adaptations in biodiversity. But yes, they all pretty much do look like that gas station symbol of the Sinclair sauropod. So think about this body plan and how successful this body plan clearly is. These animals are found on all continents for oh, 160 million years of time almost. Being this big, having that kind of neck and tail, obviously was extremely naturally selected. It worked out. So it's a really fun thing to kind of get into. So before we talk about biodiversity, which we're going to talk about the diversity, we're talking about these different clades on Tuesday, I want to talk about just general sauropod ideas for the rest of our class today. So you can read what that says. I love this figure very much. <laughs> talk about it. What do you recognize? Make some observations. Yep. 
Oh, yeah, we have nine with this round of class, I guess all of you have We asked different people to the front of the class. I think I can look at this for a long time and talk about a lot of things. So I, I'm really curious what you guys are talking about. What are you guys talking about? Um, you're talking about how many, um, the <laughs> how many bones are in the ichthyosaur? What a great thing to say. Gary, comment. I mean, they, they, they had a lot of bones. <laughs> so these are those giant ichthyosaurs from the late Triassic that Gary's been digging up in Nevada for his whole master's degree. And you would say, how many ribs do you have, Gary? I have 17. Not him personally, his ichthyosaur. Or, sorry. 17. <laughs> I have 17 of the animal's ribs. It had, you know, 50 on each side, give or take. So um, yeah. I have tiny. Ribs. So if you guys want to get a shovel and go to Nevada with Gary, we can get to 18 <laughs> ribs. <laughs> okay, but anyway, here's one of the largest ichthyosaurs. Okay. So it does have a lot of bones. What else are people talking about? So what's that big mammal under the whale? So just to give you guys a little bit of orientation. There's a human, <laughs> a dude running. Uh, and there's an African elephant, which is today the largest land uh, vertebrate wow. by weight. So there's a human and there's an African elephant. Here's a really, really, really big fossil elephant. And there are bigger fossil elephants. Um, this thing is the largest, maybe, it's certainly the tallest, it might not be the heaviest land mammal of all time. You'll learn about it, don't worry. Uh, it's a rhinoceros. <laughs> it's basically as tall as a giraffe, but it's a rhinoceros. You'll learn about it later, not now. But it is the, one of the largest land mammals. That's why it's on this slide. What's the biggest animal on this slide? The whale. <laughs> I hope you all think it's the whale. It's absolutely the whale. So one of the things I want you guys to take away from the slide is like, gee golly, sauropods are pretty big. That's true. I want you to take that away. I also want you to take away that the heaviest and the most massive animal that's ever existed in the history of life, as far as we can tell, is blue whale. And you can go to California right now with binoculars and be like, I can go look at one. That's crazy. A lot of people have ideas that dinosaurs are big, and they certainly are. Whales are bigger than they're alive right now. In terms of mass, a lot of dinosaurs are longer than whales, as you might not be surprised <laughs> just to know. Uh, but they're not heavier, that's for sure. What are the things people talking about? Oh, and just because I already relabeled the human and the elephant, here's just a couple more sauropods. All five of those sauropods are different taxa. They're different species. They're not the same thing repeated. But they're all to scale. I scaled the dudes. Blue whale's the same. Maybe look at the look at those five long-necked dinosaurs on there. Talk about them with each other. What do you notice? Yeah, 
So just to add some, just to add just a little more richness to the things I'm hearing. This is the largest duckbill dinosaur of all time. Here's the two largest armored dinosaurs of all time. There's Stegosaurus. Largest horned dinosaur, Triceratops. Two of the largest meat eaters, that's T-Rex right there, just so you have a sense of scale. So these sauropods are like on their own in terms of how big the biggest sauropods are. They are uh, even like a tier above. It's not quite log scale, but like a tier above. Even other maximum sized dinosaur lineage members these animals are tremendously huge. I think biologically that makes them extremely compelling and exciting. Because not only is this a very successful body plan that exists for many, 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 many millions of years on all continents, but they're obviously doing something. And if you look, and I heard you guys talking, so I think I get it that you are there. We're definitely gonna talk about it on Tuesday. They're not all the same. Their necks are structured very differently. Their body proportions are very different. They might all be big in the same, body size category way, but their body plans and their anatomy do vary. There's different ways of getting to these sizes. That's inherently interesting. That's a very cool kind of lab for asking scientific questions about things like body size. How fast does an animal like this grow up? Is this adult 100 years old? Is this adult 12 years old? How does that work in a vertebrate's physiology? How could you possibly get that big? This animal is really big, but when this animal has a baby, her baby's 30 feet long. <laughs> when these animals lay eggs, their eggs are this big. Wow, that's different. That's not the same. <laughs> so these are really interesting biological questions that I just wanted to like let you percolate on for a minute. We'll come back. So here's just a great picture with a more realistic scale. This is a full mount of one of those animals, Patagot Titan, at the Field Museum in Chicago. So given that there's a restaurant and a bunch of people walking around, it gives you a better sense of... <laughs> I like imagining this as like, she's an individual, and this is an individual. <laughs> like two eyes and a brain. Like mm -hmm. That's really, really cool, right? Uh, I say he only because the social media, this thing has its own Twitter and its name is Maxima. So they they gendered it, but we don't know. <laughs> so that's Maxima at the Field Museum. Check it out. Here's something that's really, really, really fun. Don't look at this so far. Don't look at that right quite yet. Over here on the side. These animals constantly mess people up. Physicists and biomechanics, people that aren't biology focused, and certainly not fossil focused, every couple of years, There'll come some book that you'll see at the airport that's like, sauropod dinosaurs couldn't have possibly walked. They're too heavy. And it's like, I don't know what to tell you, dude. There's footprints everywhere. They definitely walked. And so they're challenging our ability to like understand how vertebrates really work. It obviously worked. How did it evolve? This figure is really something. Over here in green are a bunch of like primitive traits like reptiles kind of have. Over here are some features that sauropods we think have. Avian style lung means that like unidirectional respiration you guys learned about. And this is a theoretical paper. This is a bunch of scientists trying to put together all these biological things we can ground truth about these animals to come to an understanding of how this might happen and happen multiple times, being that humongo. So do me a favor now, kind of like we did with the N Permian mass extinction flow chart, Read this, follow some arrows, see if there's one or two that you're like, oh, I get how that could be related. See if there's one that you're like, I have no idea why that would be related. And just kind of walk through this with your neighbors because there's a lot of really fun, like stretch out your brain biology considerations in this figure. So go ahead and do that. Um, <laughs> 
Please do. Yes, let the right section be the ball. Okay, my size is like six there. I just want to do that. Because it seems like a ball. But I want to take you back to the third person. I don't know if that can show up. But at least you might tell her that it's not there. It's very easy. 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 And um, what's really interesting here is if you go, we call the Amy Solomon, it's the no dead space here. I'll go to the other one. It's not holding that data, it's not their size. So it's a really, really good example. It's like these animals are a lot crazy in history. That's how they So many buffer wash, how they it's very yeah, I think it's really nice to get that person. So, like, so, are you going to be able to do that? Well, they have to find a good idea. It's like, no guy is going to be able to do that. Yeah, it's just like, it's not 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 like, it's not
you can't interrupt a nerve and you can't interrupt a blood vessel in evolution. They have to, they're tied together. And so as we evolve next, you have a, a nerve that leaves your brain, goes down your neck, wraps around your heart and comes back up to go into your throat. People do all these awesome things on YouTube. You can watch it where they dissect a giraffe from a zoo and a giraffe has a nerve that leaves its brain, goes all the way down its neck, around the heart, and all the way back up its neck to power that like purple tongue and part of its face. Every single reptile and every single amphibian and every single bird has the exact same thing. And so that means that some of these animals have 40 feet of nerve and then another 40 feet of nerve. That's really cool and very challenging to imagine. Because it's like people have published papers back in the 80s that are like, if you bit his tail, how long until he goes, oh, whoa, <laughs> because the nerve has to travel. Kind of silly, because of course it's pretty fast. <laughs> um, but people wonder, how do you make a body work this big? It's funny that nobody has a problem with it in the water. Like, they're like, oh yeah, whales just work. But for land animals, it's suddenly all different. Like, how could it possibly work? What are the things people talking about? We talked at length about the avian style lung. Okay, so this like, Unidirectional respiration. Go ahead. And then, like the really interesting idea of the long neck not having any dead space because air sacs kind of being in that neck, okay, lining the neck, making this very like you know you think about it in birds, they really have to just for very different reason. Birds aren't big. Birds. And most birds though do have pretty long necks, yeah. really. Okay, go ahead. Uh, and we kind of have some questions about whether or not the saving cell lung is uh, like share with all Cerisia, or if it's something that evolved twice, I guess. Um, oh, no, we think it's the default for, uh, I mean, a version of it for the Archosauria, and there's pneumatic vertebrae in the theropods and the sauropods, so it's probably a Cerisian thing. Oh. But a lot of the early Cerisians, like those early, the Triassic sauropodomorphs you saw, very lightly pneumatized. It's not really quite there. So it's probably soft tissue, and then as these animals get big, it goes into their bones. And actually, just because of time, I would love to keep talking about this with you guys. Let's talk about that. These necks are wild. This is one of my favorite figures from the Jurassic. All of these animals live in the same habitat. You can find them all together, which makes you wonder how does this ecosystem function if there's herds of animals that are all like this on the same landscape. Uh, but Western North America has all these animals. Here's a giraffe and an elephant for scale, <laughs> reaching their trunks and necks up to the leaves. And there's that giant rhino, don't worry about it. Um, but here's how, when I say long necks, you can see very different architectures, very different lengths. The longest necks of all the sauropods, both absolutely and relatively, are these animals called momentusaurs, which are only from the Jurassic for the most part. There's a couple that make it to the Cretaceous. These have the like most extreme necks of any vertebrate ever. We'll talk about them later. This lady is looking at the skeleton. Pretty That's cool. Insane. Isn't that insane? There's in China, they just have a bunch of the cervicals, a bunch of those neck vertebrae that are just like, you know, the neck vertebrae is half as big as this desk. And you're like, okay. And you're like, there's 28 of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But that pneumaticity is really interesting. In sauropods, it goes really wild. So there's one of these momentusaurs in an artistic reconstruction. Uh, here's a dorsal vertebra. You can see all these cavities on it. These are called fossae. At the bottom of some of these fossae, there's little holes, and the air sacs go into those vertebrae. So the vertebrae themselves in the neck, in the back, not so much in the tail, are almost totally empty space. It looks like a gigantic bone, but it's all this stuff, if you x-ray it, is mostly empty space. There's air sacs that are in there. So these bones are super, super, super highly, like, they're evolved, but you can think about them as, like, engineered to be, like, as strong as possible while being as light as possible. The thing that I love about sauropods and their body size and their pneumaticity is theropod dinosaurs ultimately evolved into things like birds, and birds use that avian-style lung to lighten their bones, and they fly around. But dinosaurs that turn into birds are all pretty tiny. These dinosaurs inherit this same kind of thing, and they use it to get bigger than anything's ever been before. But it's a similar inherited condition of having these air sacs and breathing in that way. You use it for flight, so do pterosaurs, and you get tremendously huge. Really, really, really interesting. This is a diagram of what we think those air sacs are like on the vertebrae. So here's a sauropod vertebrae with these blue air sacs drawn on. So how they connect to each other inside the bone, how they would go. There's the lung where breathing happens. Here's the front sac, which is really the one that the air would come to second. And all these sacs along here can hold that air. There's that vertebra right here going into this uh, CT machine. 
Here's the vertebra in its jacket. And then these lines are cross sections through the vertebra. So you guys can see how absolutely empty it is on the inside. It's not a massive bone that weighs 400 pounds. It's really light. Isn't that insane? So it's limbs, the limbs of these animals are massive columns. We're gonna talk about that next week. But the backbone is like very delicate and as big as it can be while like retaining its strength. Really interesting. Also, I didn't say this, I went back because I just love it. This is Brachiosaurus dorsal vertebra. Oh no, this is a Titanosaurus dorsal vertebra. And that's an entire adult human spine. Oh, for okay. To enjoy for you to deal with. <laughs> Funny. All right, last thing we'll do today. How do you evolve a long neck? These dinosaurs have really, really, really long necks. Okay, great. We're gonna take, take, take just a minute here, talk to your neighbors. What are ways you imagine biologically you could physically make a long neck that makes sense? Go ahead and chat about that. Okay, what are some options? People, maybe somebody hasn't said anything yet, throw something out. How could you possibly evolve a long neck? Add more vertebrae. Add more vertebrae. I have six, now I have 12. Okay, what's another thing? Yes. Oh, each vertebra is a longer version of itself. Great. Other ideas. Like spurs on them that reinforce them, like standing vertebrae. Oh, so you make a long neck by reinforcing it back down. That's an interesting idea. That's one way you could do it for sure. What about just like in the neck itself? Any other ideas? You guys hit two of the big ones. You can make your vertebrae individually longer. That's what giraffes certainly do. Giraffes have the same number of vertebrae in their neck as you do, but each one is like as you saw in lab. So that's one way to do it. You can add more vertebrae. Here's an expression of Hox genes. So like the genes that control your body plan as you're developing as an embryo. So they're expressed like this along the backbone of this mouse. And you can see here's that Hox 10 region in a snake and here's that other region in the snake. So a snake just hits like control C, control B a bunch of times as it's developing to like make a bunch of extra vertebrae. So you add more, you elongate each one. And then the other thing that people don't think of quite right away is you take vertebrae from other parts of your body and you put them in your neck. And so this is a population of people in Southeast Asia that they do this like culturally where the women add rings to their necks and then they get a long neck. Now what those people are doing in their culture, of course, is not evolving long neck. They're physically shoving their rib cage and their shoulders down so that their dorsal vertebrae are becoming <laughs> effectively cervical vertebrae on this lady. So of course, that is a human cultural thing, not evolutionary. But I always think of that little girl in the taco commercial because sauropods do all of these things. <laughs> they take dorsal vertebrae and make them posterior cervical vertebrae. They elongate each individual vertebra and they absolutely do add new vertebrae. There's actually cool studies of sauropod evolution, like the phylogeny of sauropods. And you can see what are probably duplication events at different nodes. Because these ones all have 14 or more, these ones all only have 10. So there's probably like a bloop, bloop, like right there. And then forever on, oh, now it's 16, now it's 18. You can see these events probably happening in their evolution, which is really, really interesting. So plenty of ways to make a long neck. As you can see, the sauropods are really, really fun. I will see you guys on Tuesday. We'll actually talk about their biodiversity and history. Okay, thank you.